What's up, everybody? All right, all right. Welcome to, hello, Alex. Hello, everybody. Woo! Hey, everybody. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, Ryans. How are you? Wagners, this is awesome. So many friendly, smiling faces. Hello, Michelle. Welcome back. Wouldn't miss it. This is awesome. This is a uh, Another uh, couple cheese professionals here on the call. Hello, Casey. It's good to see you. Um, one of our amazing events team members has joined us. This is awesome. Y'all, I am so pumped to be here. We're just waiting on a few more people to admit in. Um, this is going to be amazing. We'll let everybody kind of get their uh, uh, computer set up correctly. Uh, we have you on mute right now because Otherwise, you take away my ability to say things out loud, and I love talking. And tonight's one of those rare occasions where I don't actually get the microphone for very long. Uh, so I'm um, going to be uh, using all of my willpower to, uh, I'll get it out of my system early. Uh, looks like we actually have most everybody on. If you, those of you that don't have your cameras on, if you feel like um, including your cameras, turning them on, uh, please do. It is uh, totally awesome that you guys, we can see your faces and we can, um, we can be a part of this experience together. There's something very exciting about um, actually getting to see smiles that uh, makes my day um, and uh, often my week. So this is one of the highlights. Um, Kendall is in the other room managing our children so that uh, they don't interrupt us during this talk. Uh, so welcome everybody, welcome to Cheese 201 with Pat Pulowski, one amazing individual. Uh, I got the pleasure of uh, speaking, I guess I'm gonna say alongside at the uh, uh, keynote speech with Pat last year. He spoke, um, I think right before Kendall and I, and then Kendall and I spoke, but getting to sit in an audience of 1200 people and watch Pat um, passionately talk about cheese is one of the coolest things I've ever gotten to do. And so, uh, now that we're virtual, Indiana is right next door. In fact, when you see his video, it'll look like he's in the cheese shop. Um, and so uh, this is a real treat for us. I know that um, having the opportunity to hear from a, uh, a cheese whiz, uh, I'll go with that for now. Um, thank you. It's a real privilege. You think oh. that works, Pat? I've been called worse, thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and so just to kind of set expectations for everybody, um, tonight is really about uh, geeking out on cheese. So um, Pat is um, a food scientist by trade, uh, specializing in cheese and dairy technology. Um, he runs cheesescience.org in his free time, which is uh, one of the main go-to resources for cheese knowledge for all of us cheesemongers in the industry. I'm, I studied for my certified cheese professional exam using it. Um, and I'm sure there's a couple other certified cheese professionals on this call tonight, at least four of us uh, that have probably used his website. Um, he's currently pursuing his PhD at Purdue University in the Agricultural Sciences Education and Commu Communication Department. Um, and so I am going to try to shut up pretty much all of this experience. Um, but you should, just to set expectations, each of you should have this awesome, delicious cheese plate in front of you. I am going to spotlight my video just so that y'all can see that. Uh, and so we're going to be starting from this white fluffy cloud that should be paired with the apricots. I will, um, I will in the chat window share what the whole tasting is tonight and what the pairings are for you. Uh, but that's where we're going to start. We're going to go clockwise around the cheese plate. Um, we have seven cheeses, over a half pound of cheese for y'all. And um, What's slightly different, those of you that have attended our events in the past or even hosted our events in the past, Michelle, Nicholas, Casey, there's plenty of you on here that have. Um, we aren't going to go very deep into the tasting aspect of the cheese. So we're not going to do what we normally do and talk about maybe the flavor compounds. Um, that may be a future class with Pat Pulowski. Um, but I, um, tonight, we'll kind of hit upon them. But mostly, we want to talk about the science. We want to go into the, uh, that. Um, if you can, open your chat window. Um, let us know if you're celebrating something tonight. Let us know what you're drinking. Um, and then certainly ask questions and follow up throughout the course of the evening 
so that we can all be on the same team and have some fun. And I am going to be quiet unless somebody has a question for me. I would like to introduce Pat now. Uh, Pat, I'm going to give you the screen. Um, okay. And uh, thank you for doing this. This is a real honor to have you. Oh, thank you, John and Kendall in the background. She can hear me. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're going to dive right into it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. Just pop into the chat or interrupt me. I'll make sure to monitor it. I have some pictures of the cheeses in the slides, and we'll be talking about the science of how cheese is made. And I may not be able to resist going to some of the flavor chemistry. Apologies up front, John, but um, I, I love talking about that. But I also realize that you guys don't want to be here till midnight. So I'll be here until midnight if anyone wants to stay long, but we'll make you get back to your lives. Um, so I will now share some info. So this is basically an overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, all about how cheese is made. I like to sum it up into 10 basic steps. Um, if you go to, let me see, let me get a little laser pointer going here. If you go to cheesescience.org, the first post there is actually an infographic about uh, how cheese is made in these 10 steps. And you can download it and look at it more. We might look at it a little bit later, but without further ado, we start with milk, and when we think about milk, there's lots of things that can happen with milk. You can have sheep's milk, goat milk, cow milk, a mixture of those, and sure enough, the cheeses tonight feature all of those milks. Uh, we have acid production, we have rennet, which is making solid curd from liquid milk, and the next seven odd steps is all about removing moisture. I like to call cheese the controlled dehydration of milk, so that's what it is at the end of the day. Some cheeses are drier than others. That dictates how long they last, the flavors you can get, and usually add salt to a lot of cheeses. And so we'll dive in and talk about some of that now. Before we get too much into it, though, I have to do a little bit of chemistry. Apologies. It's just, it's in my nature. I am an academic after all, as of last year. So there's protein in milk and cheese. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Um, that's one thing it's really well known for. There's casein and whey protein. It's mostly casein in milk, about 80%. Cheese, except for ricotta, which we'll talk about, is basically 100% casein. Uh, that's the body and structure. When you bite into a piece of cheese and you feel it between your teeth, it's casein protein that you're feeling. Like when you bite into steak, that's beef protein. When you bite into cheese, you think of that as just a big casein steak. Uh, there's fat. I think to much chagrin, we, we know there's fat in cheese at various amounts. This is a lot of what causes the flavors, the breakdown of these fat compounds called triglycerides and the fatty acids. That creates all the copious and beautiful menagerie of flavor compounds, which we'll be talking about today, and which I know people have joined the Antonelli's before have learned a little bit about. Carbohydrates. Lactose is the main component in milk, actually. Aside from water, it's about 5% lactose. People who are lactose intolerant know that. But in virtually almost every cheese, I think almost every cheese we're trying tonight, in fact, except maybe one, that lactose is completely broken down into lactic acid by microbes, little bacteria that do fermentation. Uh, just like in beer, you have yeast that ferment carbohydrates into alcohol. In cheese, we have bacteria called starter cultures that ferment lactose and acid, not so much alcohol. Not yet, anyway. If uh, COVID keeps getting bad, maybe someone invents a boozy cheese that does it for us like that. Keep everyone in good spirits. And then we have minerals. Very important nutritionally. But also from a chemistry point of view, calcium is the glue that holds cheese together. Just like calcium is sort of the building blocks of bones and teeth and, and us and all animals basically, calcium is sort of the glue that's binding this whole structure together. And this picture is what I like to think about when I think about cheese, is these little blue strands. That's the protein, calcium holding it together and embedded in there is water. Sometimes we call serum, just because we have to be difficult. When we talk about academically, we have to sound erudite and superior. And then of course the fat is all embedded into that. So I like to think about cheese as though the cheese maker is going on a journey and he has lots of forks in the road he has to traverse. Some journeys are straightforward and fun. Some are very tumultuous like the grocery store right now. I mean, and it's, it's interesting the direction cheese makers can take. So the first thing they have to think about is the milk. You can choose the animal and say a cheesemaker wants to make an aged cheddar, cow's milk cheddar. He's like, oh, I'm gonna choose cow's milk. Um, that another cheesemaker, she may choose sheep's milk, so on and so forth. 
cultures, the bacteria they're using, there are different types of bacteria here. The names aren't so important. Something called mesophiles, that's what's used in cheddar cheese. It gives it its tanginess, its sharpness, its acidity, a lot of its flavor. pH, which is a measure of acidity. It's how, how acidic do you want that cheese to get? How tangy, how sharp do you want our cheddar to get? And they have control over all this, as you might imagine. How do I want to salt my cheese? Do I want to sprinkle salt over the curds and push it together? Or do I want to brine it? Uh, we'll be trying some cheeses tonight that are brined. We'll be trying some others that are dry salted. And as you might imagine, that has differences. Uh, not only the amount of salt, but how you apply salt can mean it gets into the cheese really quick and slows down the microbes, or it takes a long time to get in the cheese and the microbes can go gangbusters and create all sorts of flavors. How much salt do you want to add? The more you add, it's a preservative in a way, the slower the microbe goes. So the longer it might take to get flavor compounds. And then how much moisture do you want to retain? Um, cheese making is numbers after all, at least in the United States, there's legal definitions. If you want to call it a cheddar, you have to be a certain percent moisture and such. And cheese makers may not be doing it as analytically, but they're using different tweaks and different know-how and sort of taking an artisan approach of saying, well, I'm going to press it a little harder. I'm going to cook it a little hotter to remove more moisture. And all these are different things they can make a choice of. And of course, aging. Um, aging is a big thing as well. Uh, that's, an that, that's an investment for many cheesemakers. It's not cheap, especially in the South, of keeping a cheese in refrigerated space for five years before you sell it, as you might imagine. So that's a very deliberate decision they have to make. But say they take a few different approaches. Say they reduce the salt a little bit, increase the moisture a little bit, uh, and maybe the cheesemaker's feeling a little nefarious and he's trying to you know, if you're selling water, that's what, that's the name. I'll give you a little secret. I've worked in the industrial food industry a big, uh, for quite a long, long time now. The name of the game is to sell water because that's cheap. And so maybe this cheesemaker is trying to do that. Uh, but if, if by going down this route, the cheese would turn really bitter and nasty. And this is actually a question I get actually a lot right now because of COVID is that, can I go just to the dairy section of my grocery store and buy the really cheap big blocks of mild cheddar, just stick it in my fridge for the duration of the quarantine and you know, a year or two, not saying it's gonna last that long, hopefully, fingers crossed, and then be left with beautiful aged cheddar. And no, unfortunately, and that's not true. Mild cheddar and aged cheddar are made differently. One is not, you can't age mild cheddar, it'll turn into a bitter, nasty mess. Um, it, a cheesemaker has to be deliberate if they wanna age out the cheese, usually with a little higher salt, usually with lower moisture. And then the, 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 rope, the forks in the road don't stop there. So you can cow, milk, goat, some cheeses are made with pasteurized milk by heating the milk. Some cheeses, they homogenize the milk. The milk you drink from the store is homogenized. That just means they break down the fat globules in smaller pieces. Uh, so it doesn't rise to the top and form a cream line. Anyone who's had farm fresh milk knows the top is a little thicker. It almost looks like butter. It's unhomogenized milk. And then standardization, that's just a fancy word for saying they're gonna add cream to it or add skim milk to it to sort of alter the composition, more fat. A uh, good example of this may be blue cheese. Um, a lot of blue cheeses, they pasteurize the milk because they don't want extra microbes competing with the mold. They homogenize the milk to break down the fat into smaller pieces because once it's fat's in smaller pieces, it can turn into flavor easier, more surface area, think about it that way. And then they'll add fat as well to get even more flavor, they'll add cream to the milk. So blue cheese maker may choose to do all of these to their extreme for better flavor. I like to, I like to talk about how when you determine what kind of cheese you're making, whether it's goat milk, sheep milk, cow milk, there's differences in composition. Um, sheep's milk is really, really rich compared to cow and goat milk. What I'm trying to show here is, you know, they have a lot more fat and protein. You may be saying, Pat, one percentage points, two percentage points, does that really matter much? In cheese making, it does, because as you might imagine, when you're making this milk into cheese, you're removing almost all of the water. It's so basically a 10 to one ratio. Every 10 pounds of milk, you get one pound of cheese. So these differences are multiplied by 10. So a, a two percentage point here is 20 percentage point difference in the cheese sometimes. And so sheep's milk being a lot higher in fat and protein uh, has lots of outcomes that are important for cheese making. And I take this opportunity to dispel a myth I hear perpetuated quite a bit that goat milk and goat milk cheeses are lactose free or have less lactose. That is entirely not true. Lactose across goat, cow, sheep, buffalo, is all about equivalent. It's within rounding errors, really, all about 5%. Um, so if you eat goat milk or goat milk cheeses and they agree with you better than a cow's milk cheese or cow's milk, it's not the lactose. It could be the differences in protein. 
Um, after all, proteins can cause allergies, so maybe you're just a little allergic to a cow protein. Uh, it's not the lactose, though, to, to, say, to say the least. And yield, this is something cheesemakers like to think about. Um, for every pound of milk of sheep's milk you get, you get twice as much cheese because there's all the extra fat and protein. Like I said before, you're dehydrating this milk. Uh, so if there's more fat and protein, there's less water to remove. Simple as that. By breed, nothing too important to talk about here. I just like these pictures of the cows. I'm big. I love cows. Um, I'm, they're, like cow, they're like cats or dogs if you ever get to spend time around cows. Brown Swiss cows are literally just big dogs. They'll come running up to you, lick your face. They're the kindest animals. Goats and sheep, I cannot stand. They're a scourge on this earth. They are just so mean and antisocial. They make good cheese, but you know, I don't want to hang around with them like I do cows. And just again, some of these breeds, the Jerseys or Guernseys, for example, they have really high fat and protein, as you can see here. They almost act like sheep's milk. And some cheesemakers choose to use those cows and their milks for cheese for that reason. It's more efficient. It's, it, you get higher quality cheese because there's more fat and protein in it. Really quickly, I also want to talk about this because it's, it's, a, it's a thing that comes up a lot, I think, and uh, especially when people are shopping for cheese and such. And it is, what is raw, what is pasteurized milk? In the United States, there's really specific definitions. Uh, milk has to be heated at these temperatures down here. Uh, exactly this, exactly that time. Usually it's a little more than that because yeah, these are bare minimums. If it's done that, you can call it pasteurized. Um, if it's not done that, it's raw. Some cheesemakers choose to do that. Some cheesemakers choose to apply no heat whatsoever. Many cheesemakers choose to go somewhere in the middle to try to get the best of both worlds. If you, if you wipe out the entire microbial palate from the milk, there's usually less flavor potential later on, or you have to try harder to get flavor back in. These microbes produce flavor. They're a little intestinal microbial metabolisms are just boatloads of potential flavor. Um, but that being said, maybe you don't want things to compete. Like I said earlier, a lot of blue cheese, they like pasteurized milk because they don't want the mold to have to compete for nutrients. They want it to be unabashedly break down the cheese to make blue cheese flavor. Just going to look at the chat real quick, make sure I, I think I missed a question here. Well, I think the uh, very interesting Question so far is what is the weirdest animal that you've had a cheese oh, milk made from? So let's see. I've had horse milk cheese quite a bit. Um, that's really common in Mongolia and other places in Asia. That's trying to think of even weirder ones. I'm pretty sure you just that was good enough for most of the people. Oh, okay, never mind. Okay. Yeah, like, okay. <laughs> horse was pretty good. I had camel milk cheese last year. Um, yeah, oh, I've had camel too, yeah. In fact, uh, one of the main enzymes in cheese making rennet, uh, they make a genetically modified version where they took the gene out of a camel and put it in bacteria. And that's actually a really common way most industrial cheese is made now. It's Camel rennet is the best rennet for making cheese. Oh, Who'd have wow. thunk it? So, oh, Who knew? That's a great so if you go get a block of craft yellow cheddar, it's probably made with camel rennet. Well, the, the recombinant version, at least, the stuff grown in the lab. That's Yak awesome. milk was not good. Michelle, yeah. Michelle Harum, she <laughs> led uh, our Cypress Grove cheese tasting two weeks ago. And um, she's a certified cheese professional too. So all of us cheese nerds have tasted something bizarre. Yeah, there's just, I'm one of my best friends. She's from Nepal. Um, she's a dairy scientist. Uh, she works for Walmart actually. And they have these yak milk candies. I'm not sure you can call it candy. Uh, that's supposed to invoke a pleasing sound, but it's not. I've tried it and it's, it's basically just like sort of salty milk pellets. But, you know, you grew up with it, you learn to like it. Yeah. So there's two types of protein in milk. We discussed casein and whey. Whey protein, you could think about as sort of bundled up little strands. And when you add heat to it, it sort of unfurls. In scientific terms, we call that denaturing. Um, when that happens, those ends that are exposed, this SH, that's chemistry, sulfur hydro groups, not important for our discussion. They hate water. They don't like being around other things. So they're going to cling to whatever they want to cling to. Sometimes they cling to casein protein, which is say what's in milk. Sometimes they cling to each other. And this is taken advantage of in two very common dairy products. One is yogurt and the other is ricotta. And that brings us to the first cheese tonight if, if no, one's, no one's tasted that yet. So what they do to make ricotta cheese is they basically take the whey left over from, so first of all, does anyone speak Italian on the, 
on the call, um, or at least broken enough Italian to know cotta means cooked and ricotta means recooked. If anyone's ever had, uh, there we go, Casey. Yes, you could tell the group. So if anyone's ever had biscotti cookies, biscotto means twice cooked. And that's why they're so dry and crumbly. Ricotta means recooked. They took the whey from the cheese, which is basically waste products, all that liquid that drains off. Cats love it, by the way, or you can water your plants with it. Um, I give it to my cats. They really dig it. It's like milk, except I guess lower in protein and fat. So keep them in shape, I guess. Um, they take that, they heat it up really, really hot. They add acid or cultures that produce acid. And that the thing I just described, maybe actually here, I'll, uh, I always have my pipe cleaners not too far away. So repetition is the key to learning, right? So they take these little whey proteins, which are sort of flying around in the milk and the whey. They add heat. That sort of deferls them, denatures them, we like to say. These exposed ends don't like being around all that water. So they're going to do two things. They're going to stick to each other. And sort of, you can imagine they form a mesh. And in that mesh, you can embed water and fat. And that's sort of why ricotta is almost soupy and really soft. It's water and fat can get trapped in here. Um, this reaction also happens and it, these ends really like metal. So if you've ever cooked milk in a pot and it really sticks to the sides, this is exactly the same reaction going on. Um, they'll, they'll stick to anything they can, each other or metal or casein or anything like that. Or if you ever had like pudding and the top is sort of that weird skin, um, it's sticking really much to each other into the air to try to protect itself. And that's also what's going on there. So lots of cool stuff there. Let's see, let me get back on the screen real quick. Move on there. If anyone has anything. Well, and, and that yogurt, this ricotta that we're using has vinegar as its um, acid. I don't know if you're going to hop into that in a minute, probably. Um, but uh, go ahead and eat this. We paired it with a tur Turkish apricot. It tastes like breakfast. It's delicious and wonderful. And I've already eaten it. This is actually... Those of you that have had ricotta from our shop before, um, the ricotta that we sell in the shop is a hand-dipped ricotta. It's uh, whole milk, so it's this fluffy sort of um, uh, like cloud-like. It tastes like amazing heaven. It's one of my all-time favorite products. The version that we're tasting tonight, we brought in for a client, um, and we chose it specifically for this class. So this is... Um, probably the first time you're having this Calabro product. This is more of their, um, uh, what you'd expect, what, what chefs would use for a cooking ingredient oftentimes, but it still tastes amazing. It just does, it has a little uh, more um, uh, graininess to it than the whole milk ricotta that we sell in the shop. Well, thank you, John. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of ricotta any time of the day. So like you said, with apricot, so that's, that's a good breakfast. And Ricotta is probably the easiest cheese to make at home. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about that because you should be buying a ricotta from John and yeah. Kendall. You should if not somebody, be making it at home. But if somebody is willing to <laughs> make it at home, that means they love cheese, and that's all that matters. Uh, and yeah, so you, you can actually you can actually just do it with milk if you don't have whey. That's basically what paneer is. If anyone's familiar with paneer, the, the what's really common Indian cooking, you can just use regular milk, microwave it for a minute or two, dump in some vinegar, and you get ricotta. And that's sort of what I'm trying to show with this slide is when we're producing acid and cheese, there's really two main things a cheesemaker can do. They can use what are called starter cultures, which take lactose and ferment in with lactic acid, or they can add acid directly. Uh, they can add lactic acid, which is what the starter culture would have made for them. They can add acetic acid, which is vinegars, just a weak solution of that. Or they can add citric acid, which is say, if you ever make ricotta with lemon juice, the citric acid in there is, uh, is what's doing that. So there's no excuse. You should be making ricotta at home. It's, it's really fun. And a fun tip actually is the microwave works much better than the stove top in home, in home applications. Uh, it'd be the softest, most tender ricotta I've ever had. I don't know what it is with that microwave, but they, uh, it has a certain effect on those proteins that you can't really recreate on the stove top easily. So cultures, as I mentioned, are bacteria. I just want to put some more information for anyone who's curious. You have lactose here. Uh, this is the compound that some people can't break down in their small intestine, those who are lactose intolerant. It is fermented by lactic acid bacteria. If you really want to sound impressive, 
and if you know i try to use these as pickup lines sometimes at parties it doesn't really work but say hey that cheese is probably made with lactococcus lactis subspecies lactis biovariant diastolactis and i've had mixed results but i encourage everyone listening to try it themselves to see how effective it is And there's two main types. There's mesophilic cultures and thermophilic cultures. This refers to the temperatures. Uh, mesophiles don't like things too much above body temperature. Thermophiles like a little more heat. So like 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And they're in cheeses that almost you can consider more sweet. So mozzarella is made with that. That's cooked at a little higher temperature. Swiss cheeses are cooked at a higher temperature. Uh, Dutch style cheeses like Gouda's are cooked at a little higher temperature. That's where you use some of these. And they usually give a sweet flavor. So uh, with enough age, so that's one reason why a, like Gruyere and Comte, as we'll taste later, have sort of that sweet nuttiness that the microbes are using. And now that brings us to coagulations. We have our milk, we've made some acid in it or have added it directly, and now we need to turn it into a solid. And there's lots of different ways a cheesemaker can do that. Um, feel free to start tasting the Chev here. I'll talk about how that was coagulated because it's actually a mixture of a couple of these. There's enzymatic coagulation, uh, which is how many, many cheeses, the most cheeses people think of when they think of cheese is probably enzymatically coagulated, which is another word for rennet, which is a something that originally came from a calf's fourth stomach, the abomasum. And what that does is it takes those casein proteins and causes them to stick together. You can add acid as well. This also accomplishes the same thing. When you've ever heard of curdled milk, or you've heard of, you know, if you have milk that's gotten way too old and it's sort of starting to get chunky in the bottle, it got chunky because it got coagulated because all those naturally occurring bacteria produce this acid and it caused it to curdle or coagulate or solidify or flocculate or aggregate, choose, choose your word, whichever you want, pick your poison. I shouldn't use that metaphor for a tasting, but uh, whatever term you'd like to, to attribute it to. Or you can use heat. Um, I think like I mentioned earlier, if you heat milk hot enough, those whey proteins don't like that and they stick together. Ricotta sort of uses a combination of acid and heat. So does mascarpone. Uh, the Chev here, um, it's basically, I like to say 95% acid coagulated. So they just add a lot of acid or they use micro starter cultures to produce a lot of acid and that causes it to firm up. Um, sometimes they add a little bit of rennet uh, just to ensure it gets firmer and to help remove some water and whey and that's basically what's going on there. To give you an idea chemically what's going on, the casein micelles, that's what this is trying to show here. They have these little hairs on the outside, they're bouncing off each other because they're, they're like magnets with the same pole, they're all negatively charged. So they're just bouncing, sloshing past each other, that's what makes milk liquid. Coagulation means make them stick together. Now if you imagine this, two of them not gonna do much, but all trillion of them doing it, you're gonna get a solid. And all the water that was there is gonna wanna leave and that's what whey is. And I love to repeat myself, so I have more props. Where I have my pipe cleaners, my tennis balls aren't so far behind. Um, so you can might imagine those micelles, at least tennis balls, they have magnets on the outside of the same pole, and they're just bouncing off each other. Imagine this happening in cheese all over, or milk, I should say, constantly. The glass of milk in front of you, if you have a glass of milk, I don't think people just have glass of milk in front of them. I do. They are just doing this over and over again. When you're adding acid or you're adding rennet or you're heating up the milk, it's basically removing this charge, or in this case, my magnets. And now that hairy surface is now free to stick together. And this can happen a trillion and trillion times and you get that structure I showed you earlier. And that, that's what's going on there. And that, that's the most important step in cheese me, I, I like to say, because once that happens, you're not going back. If you have a big pot of acidulated milk, you might be able to do something else with it. But as soon as you've coagulated, it's like, ah, Shoot, well, I gotta do something with this. Hopefully make some cheese. So how's everyone digging the ricotta? So yeah. The or the chev rather, there we go. Both were tasting great. So the ricotta, like uh, like Pat said, we, this one used vinegar, uh, the ricotta purely vinegar to coagulate. Um, the chev, this is meat cortisone from Bee Tree Farm, which is like uh, in Maynard, Texas, 20 minutes outside of Austin, um, Jenna has been doing this for a bunch of years and uh, makes really incredible, um, bright, acidic chev. Uh, again, mostly acid coagulation. 
lactic set. And then um, we paired it tonight with a raspberry champagne jelly from Robert Lambert in California, who's like, I'm, I'm, it's amazing. It's a wonderful flavor profile. It's a, a very small batch. We're only one of four places in the country that he sells to. So really cool pairing, really fun, vibrant, good acidity. Um, lots of smiles I see in the videos. So um, back, to, back to you, Pat. Uh, and anybody that has a question, please go ahead and let us know. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, you, something I've always, it's before I got into cheese, you know, I was like, why is it always called fresh chev? Is there, you know, is there old chev? And it, it has to do with chev means goat in French. And in context, chev just means any goat cheese. So you have to say fresh because otherwise chev prefer to more aged goat cheeses. We'll be trying one here in a minute. Um, so if anyone's curious about that. So say you have the coagulated milk and now you have that curd. That's what curds and whey are, by the way. You have coagulated milk, you have curds and whey. Um, again, if you want to sound really smart and put Miss Muffet to shame, you can say, well, those curds, oh, that's casein. So you can call it casein and whey. Um, you can heat those up and stretch it. And that's what the pasta filata process is. And that brings us to our next cheese, the, the queso Oaxaca. Um, it's, it's not Oaxaca. I pronounce it that way for you, I'm joking, but uh, you know, if you, if you never knew, that's probably how you'd be pronouncing it. And that's made very similarly to things like string cheese. It's, it's very similar to mozzarella. Um, if those curds are stretched, it sort of aligns the protein structure, what I'm trying to show here, those protein strands get aligned, uh, which does really unique things to the texture, as you might imagine. It melts really beautifully because that, that allows for nice stretching or stringiness if you're pulling it apart as well. Uh, that's another fun cheese to make at home is mozzarella. It's a little more difficult than ricotta. Uh, you have to find a good milk. You have to buy some. Uh, oh, let's see, John is oh, I'm peeling dropping. it apart. Yeah, well, you can peel it apart. And you can see it's sort of like string cheese. You can see where they kind of pulled it. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's, that is a, uh, it's one of my favorite cheeses, especially when it's been braided into a ball here. Um, which is, you know, more, no, most people don't buy it because like industrially, like you can buy ones that are big. My family, actually, my dad's side of the family is, uh, they're all from the Oaxaca region of Mexico. And I go back and visit quite often, not recently, obviously, but um, it's, it's one of my favorite cheeses. And what makes it pretty unique and different from most mozzarellas you'd find in this country, even Italy at this point, is it's not, they, they use cultures, uh, which produces a lot more flavor than just adding acid directly. And by adding those cultures, you get this really nice, really interesting flavor. It's much more than string cheese. I mean, it tastes tangy. It has some other interesting, almost grassy notes. Um, and it just, when it's, it's, it's kneaded into a ball like that, into like a woven little package, it just, it just it looks cool too. Pat, when you're making a pasta filata, why do you dunk it into warm water or very, very warm water. Yeah, that's a good question. It's it's basically make the cheese softer so you can stretch it. As, as it cools down, instead of stretching it, it just break. Uh, so it really is, uh, you're basically, s not completely, but you're trying to melt the cheese just enough to get it to stretch. Um, it's sort of like when you have anyone who's pulled taffy knows, like if it gets a little too cold, like it's just gonna break. Or uh, maybe if, like, I remember this one time, quick tangent, I was making homemade Tootsie Rolls and I was stretching it way too hot and I had blisters all over my hands for weeks after that. People, people really thought I was, I was an idiot or something doing that. And upon further reflection, I was, I probably should wear gloves. Uh, but still, that should not prevent anyone from trying to make this cheese at home. It's a lot of fun to make at home. Um, but uh, an actual interesting thing is a lot of the mozzarella you buy in the store that is say, you know, next to the cream cheese, that section of the dairy case, um, it hasn't been, it hasn't been stretched. It's just been pushed together like cheddar has been. Um, it, and it's, it's okay for some things, but for other things it won't perform as well. As you might imagine, a pizza won't be quite as stretchy. Okay, so now that brings us to uh, our next topic and our next cheese here, which I believe is the garocha. And that's, now we had a fresh chef, now we're gonna have an aged chef, an aged goat's milk cheese. And that, you're also going to taste some interesting goaty flavors. Uh, you know, goat cheeses taste like goat smell, so I like to say. And the reason for that has to do with fatty acids. Uh, fatty acids, real quick, I have another prop, of course. Uh, fatty acids come in different lengths. 
do the number of carbon atoms. Here I have these black dots here are carbon atoms. This is one, two, three, four. Anyone who remembers their, uh, their organic chemistry, meth, eth, pro, bute. Um, so this would, this would be the base unit for butyric acid if it had an acid group on here, uh, which is what causes the, the unique smell of baby vomit and provolone cheese. But if you add on a couple more to this, you get six, eight, 10, you get what these are right here. You get, you get these guys right here, the caproic, caprylic, capric, and lauric. And for those Latin scholars in the room, the someone who mentioned earlier, they speak Italian, you'll know these are each words for goat. And that might give you a clue of what they smell like. This is what gives goat cheeses their unique smell, is they basically have twice as much of these fatty acids as cow's milk and sheep fall somewhere in the middle. So it really gives it that animalic barnyardy flavor in a good way. And there's also lots of other interesting compounds going on as well that, that lead to this. And I think that'd be a good time now. I, I wanted to make sure as we got going that, you know, we'll keep everyone well fed so we can, we can taste the next, the next cheese as hey, well. Pat, there was a question about the Oaxaca. Yeah. Uh, the, um, Tabitha said this is a much softer version than one she typically gets. Um, so my question to you is, um, why could that occur, that you'd have a, a different texture in the pasta filata category? That's a great question. Yeah, it's, it could be a couple things. Um, it could be due to aging. Um, if it still has some stretch to it, and it still has some structure, and you can still pull it apart a little bit, it's probably not so much aging. Um, it could just be a little more water in it, or a little more fat, probably, more likely. Um, if you think about cheese as being a sponge, I'm sorry, another another prop. Um, I, if you think about cheese as being sort of a sponge, or in this case, a bath loofa, oh gosh, this light, it's hard to see with, there we go. Turn down the color temperature a bit so you can see this better. As you might imagine, a sponge that's really dry is firm, and a sponge has lots of water in it is softer. Same thing as with the cheese. When you shove more water or fat into a structure, um, it sort of softens. And that might be why the Oaxaca is a little softer than usual. Is the water and moisture, the water and the fat content can vary. It might be a little higher. In fact, that's why a lot of cheeses are softer than other cheeses. They just have a little more water in them. And quickly, I found this, I found a bunch of these one time at a store. I bought like 90 of them because they have these little clay exfoliating beads in there. And I like to call this the calcium glue that's holding us together. So I use these as demos. And I used to actually take scissors to them to talk about the chemistry of what's going on, but I stopped doing that because I can't find them anymore. Uh, so if anyone does find these, please let me know. I will book a plane ticket just to go purchase more of these. That's how important of a prop they are. Um, even, even with COVID, I'd still, I'd, I'd risk it. I'd go to an airport, anything for a good prop. <laughs> Awesome. But thank you for answering that. No problem. I, it's, it's a good question. It comes up in a lot of different cheeses too. And we had another question uh, from uh, 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 CCP that was, are there any, are any of those flavored compounds of the fatty acid um, chains responsible for bucky flavor? So that flavor of, I imagine, licking a buck. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is, to be perfectly honest, the, the, what you're smelling and tasting, the goatee of goat cheese is the same exact thing that causes the goatee of goats. And whether that's bucks as far as um, goat bucks or general mammalian funk, so to speak. Yeah, a lot of it's the fatty acids because um, a lot of these end up in the milk, but they could also be in the sweat of the animal. I mean, they're, they're partitioned into the fat. So anywhere there's fat, so the skin... Um, it can just sort of exude that smell and aroma and it does make its way into the cheese sometimes and it's, it's pretty cool how that works if um, oftentimes you don't get the you don't get to it unless you know it's a farmer but you can actually taste if a, if a cow got into a pasture and ate something they weren't supposed to eat like the cheese will taste oniony if they found some wild onions growing because it carried all the way through um, general mammalian <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's get that print on t-shirts while we're at it. General Mammalian Funk. There we go. <laughs> nice. <laughs> we just missed Father's Day. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's next year. All right. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've got our cheese. It's, it's coagulated. We have our curds. Now let's separate that way. Uh, the one big step a cheese maker do is they cut the curds or cut the cheese, so to speak. And every place I've worked, 
you're not allowed to make those jokes. That's like fireable offense. That way puns, as you might imagine, when you work in the dairy industry, people get very upset. So we can use them here though, amongst friends. But they take this big piece of curd, basically. You can imagine that's what's in this big vat here. And they cut it into smaller pieces. And as you might imagine, now they've increased the surface area dramatically. Um, and now whey can sort of be squeezed out of that sponge much more efficiently and you get a lot more moisture loss and you get the separation of curds in the way. And how they're doing that is something called cheese knives or cheese harps. That's what we're trying to show you here. This here is spirulina. That is, that's uh, what is traditionally used to make Parmesan. This picture I took when I was in Italy. This is what's traditionally used to make a Parmigiano Reggiano. And how big the pieces are determine how dry the cheese is. You may cut it really, really, really small pieces. You have lots and lots of surface area. You're gonna lose a lot of moisture. You cut it really big pieces, you're gonna retain a lot of moisture. So Parmesan at this stage looks like rice and brie at this stage is like the size of apples. I mean, it's, it's, it's hardly even cut into pieces because they want to retain lots of moisture, keep the cheese nice and soft. And that is, takes us to our next cheese, I believe. Um, that's, that's, I tried to find a, a picture. Oh, let's see what John has a picture to show well, us. Let's see. It's not amazing, but let's just say that uh, it's something. Somebody asked what the rind is. Uh, Oh, oh yeah, but this is um, this is us at the facility here uh, in uh, uh, Albio, which is like this tiny little town in Spain, just west of um, um, of Barcelona. And th this is the garrocha growing, um, and it's growing a uh, an ambient mold that they've cultivated in this old. Um, historic basically home in the middle of this tiny tiny town um i don't know that doesn't look like any of them you see this is this is albio, uh, albio this the, all these fields that's why you get such great flavors coming through they have amazing grasses but it's a uh, an ambient mold that's growing and it just grows up puffs up like a cotton ball i remember when we were in there the power had gone out so we were using a little flashlight and i remember he sp had spelled like antonelli in the mold on a bunch of wheels of cheese in a row because it was so puffy that you can just take your finger and you can press it down and it's like a fresh, it's like a blanket of snow almost, uh, but gray instead. This is one of the coolest little cheese makers in the world. Um, if ever you get to go to Albio, the only thing that I think exists in that town is this house that has been turned into a cheese making facility. So it's super cool. And we paired it with tart cherries. So I imagine, um, I hope you enjoy it and love it. I'll go back to you, Pat. Oh yeah, thank you, John. I mean, the next time you guys go on a vacation like that, you need a cabin boy, someone to carry your bags. I, I volunteer, so. That was great. Just hanging out at getting your name spelled in cheese wheels. That's really cool. That's really, I mean, he's trying to impress you so you, you know you sell his product, so. <laughs> I'll see if I can find the actual picture of that. You'll have to give me a few minutes. Um, so that brings us to our next cheese, the sheep's milk cheddar. Um, cheddar, when they're at the stage of cutting it up, um, you could say it's about the size of walnuts if we're keeping along with the, the food, the food metaphors for the size of these pieces. So it's relatively large, half inch, inch cubes, because it's, it's sort of, in, in cheese speak, it's sort of middle of the road as far as moisture content, which cheddars would be. Um, and this is a sheep's milk cheddar from Hooks. And you may be tasting a little sheepiness. It's a little, usually we say it's a little less animalic than goat because those fatty acids are somewhere different. But there's other compounds and some sheep's milk almost have the smoky phenolic compound. I'm, I'm hesitant to say what we say in the sensory world because it, it, it's gonna sound like a, a detriment to the cheese or like I'm dissing the cheese, but Band-Aid almost. It has this, the phenolic compound sometimes we refer to as hospital or Band-Aid like, and it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to really describe. Oh, John, someone's asking what is being paired with the cheddar? Uh, we Let's have see. with the cheddar tonight. Uh, oh, great. Uh, let me send it. I was actually looking for the picture of this, the Garocha rind. So I'll send out that pairing information right now. It's Tien Gang by Maru. It's a dark chocolate from Vietnam. 
And this is a uh, block, 40 pound block cheddar from Wisconsin from Hooks made with sheep milk. Tony Hook, he's one of my favorite cheese makers in Middle right. Point, Wisconsin. He, uh, he's a master. He produces literally every type of cheese you can imagine. Um, he has one called Tilson's Point and it's a blue cheese and it tastes exactly like cow manure, but it has a cult following for some reason. That's it, just my, I'm sensationalizing a bit. Oh, here, let's, let's I've see. Got the, that. I've got that. Uh, oh, did you, uh, let me spotlight me. There we go. Oh, I can't get a good angle there. You can kind I of see it. Yeah, look at that. That's cool. The way that it was, you can, that was his finger going into that mold and you can see how it's puffed up around it. It's pretty amazing. So. That's right, not a bad idea. He should do that for weddings. He could spell the names. That would be awesome. <laughs> Back to you, sir. <laughs> I'll spotlight you. Let's All see. right, there you go. Cool, so now we're you. on the soup milk cheddar. Um, again, this is a great block cheddar. It's got a good salt content, and Tony is an amazing person. So enjoy it with the dark chocolate. Seventy-two percent, I believe. I love chocolate and cheese. It, it go it. The bitterness and the chocolate usually really does well with almost any cheese, but like John said, the saltiness, it, it, really, it really does well. Um, so we've, we've cut up these cheeses into curds. Now we're gonna cook and stir them. And, and the reason we're doing that, again, is to remove more moisture. As you might imagine, by cooking these curds, you're squeezing the sponge, wringing out that moisture. Uh, stirring is basically to make sure they don't get stuck together and make sure you get all the moisture removed that you'd like. And this is a point where you sometimes hear it referred to as cooked cheeses or cooked pressed cheeses. The next cheese will be tasted in the Comte from our Petit. That, that is an example of a cooked pressed cheese because it's relatively low in moisture, very firm. And just to sort of drive home the point here, as you heat up those curd particles, they shrink, contract. Uh, Cineresis occurs, if you want another word to impress people with the bars. And basically whey is expulsed, it's, it's, it's draining more. Uh, some cheeses aren't heated whatsoever. Lots of soft cheeses are that way. Uh, it's basically once the milk has been coagulated, coagulation usually needs a little bit of a higher than room temperature to be really efficient. But after that point, it never sees heat again until you cook with it, maybe. A brie, for example. Um, brie is really, really soft because there's lots and lots of water, not necessarily because of the fat. It's another Lactose, that's one of my soapbox things. Another thing is that soft cheeses are fatty. Um, it's it's because all that water is in that brie. They don't cut it into small pieces. They don't cook it. They don't press it. It retains a lot of that water, which means it gets nice and soft and soupy later on as the age is out. Um, so we can maybe we could dive in and and taste the uh, the Comte. Uh -huh. This is a picture of some cheese curds being cooked and stirred. Um, this is in a cheese plant up in Wisconsin, back in my Wisconsin days. Um, looks like John says, oh, we can have balsamic onions with it. Oh, that is match made in heaven. I am pumped. I am pumped. This is one of, uh, Pat, one of the two cheeses that made me fall in love with handmade cheese at the beginning of my, uh, 12 years ago. At the beginning of my journey, I fell in love with Comte. Uh, by Marcel Petit and Oso Irati. Those two, like, those were my two first loves. I, I, just, I really love it. I mean, you know, it's, Comte sometimes almost can have that oniony, brothy character itself. So I think that's a match made in heaven of the balsamic onions. Yeah, and for people who are trying the Comte, you may be getting a little crunch every now and then, depending on your piece. Those are tyrosine crystals. That's a byproduct of the protein breakdown. And Let's see, I have, as you might imagine, I, as many props as I have in person surrounding me, I have just as many basically in the form of a uh, web browsers as well. So let me see if I can go here, find the, uh, the zoom controls are in the way, one sec. If any of you have purchased Cheese a gift. crystals, there we go. If any of you have purchased a gift from us over the last um, eight months, uh, Pat lent us his cheese wheel that we uh, put in. So cheesescience.org, we have that cheese wheel that comes in all the packages. And that's all comes from Pat, which is amazing. Yeah, and if anyone's struggling to sort of uh, 
elucidate and de define a term, you can go to cheesescience.org slash wheel, see this guy, and that's just a thought starter. Uh, but here's an example. This is actually a picture of Compte right here, this, this one on the right here, and those you can see some little crystals in there. Let's give them the crunch. Uh, zoomed in under a microscope, they, they look almost like snowflakes, uh, which is a – I'm a big snowflake Bentley fan for anyone who knows who that is. Um, he's a guy from Vermont who took a lot of pictures of snowflakes back in the day. And um, crystals are really cool, and they give the crunch to almost any cheeses you get. If you ever see cheese with sort of that white haze on the surface, it's usually crystals, not mold, um, those kinds of things. Uh, let's, let's keep on chucking here. We've now encouraged all this way to be removed, so we have to drain it away, drain the way away. I, one time I tried to craft the longest sentence of just the word way as possible. And I think I got to like six, seven words in, and it just sounds like complete nonsense. But I love words like that. English language is beautiful in that way. Uh -huh. So you got 10 pounds of milk. And something like cheddar, it's a nine-to-one ratio, like I mentioned earlier. Um, you basically start, as you might imagine, uh, an easy way of thinking about this is, and you might be saying, why am I using pounds and not gallons? It's because actually in the milk dairy industry, everything's done by weight. Nothing's done by volume. A uh, pound of milk, a uh, gallon of milk is about 8.6 pounds. So if you think about the 10 to 1 thing, 8.6 pounds, 0.8 pounds is what? About 12 ounces, which is what one of those little blocks of cheddar that come in that blue label with the company that starts with K is. So if you think about, if you want to think about that, that little block of cheese you'd get, you know, next to your cottage cheese in the grocery store came from a gallon of milk. Think about sort of now you can sort of see all this water they have to deal with now all this way and if anyone's really curious here's the here's the breakdown of all the components by by exact measures but what's really difficult is that this way depending how acidic it is it's filled with useful things it can have lots of lactose in it, it can have minerals in it, it can have a little it can have whey protein in it and this is what drives a lot of the dairy industry now um, as you might imagine, the supplement market's really big on whey protein, those kinds of things, and they can thank cheesemakers for a lot of that because they've, they've sort of turned that in. And, um, and like I said, animals love this stuff too. Cats love it. Pigs go gaga over this. In antiquity, cheesemakers would always have a pig or two they keep around, one, because it just eats whatever, so it's sort of like the garbage disposal, but they'd eat the whey, and it's sort of almost a selling point now. You can you know have whey-fed prosciutto or whey-fed Serrano, those kinds of things, and because uh, whey has some fat and has protein, and it just tastes really good to pigs. So it's a good way of fattening them up. Uh, the next step would be sort of, as you can see, this is the beginning of the cheddaring process here. They're they're taking those curds, mashing them together, matting them, squashing them, uh, causing them to what we call knit. Knit means sort of seaming. Those seams are disappearing. You're making a solid block of cheese from all these curd particles, and that's what's going on there. Um, sometimes you can get a cheese and you can see the seams. You can see the little outlines. That's what we call seamy in the business. Very creative name. And that can be done for a lot of reasons. Sometimes cheesemakers want to do that. Sometimes they take those curds, soak them in something, then push them together and it gives cheese a mosaic look. Uh, one of my favorite cheeses for 4th of July would be like Cahill Porter, if anyone's had that cheese. It's, it's like you see all these little brown lines going through because they take those curds, soak them in beer and then push it together. So you get this really cool look of, you can see where the beer was. <laughs> somebody, somebody had asked what, what craft, I'm assuming that the company that starts with K does with their excess way. And I think it's really cool to note that some smaller producer, producers do some pretty amazing things with, um, with way. I, um, have you gotten a chance to go to Cedar Grove, Pat, and see Bob's? It's I have. A, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Eight, eight tanks, and the whey feeds into the first tank, and he use, and it progresses all the way to the final tank, and he, he uses plants and fish to break down the whey into usable water for the land, which is just amazing. It's a, 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 a bio system, a biosphere that basically breaks it down. And then a lot of other uh, small producers actually send it to pig farms and stuff. You can make gin with it. Um, yeah, yeah that's, there we go. And we do have a question from Shana Horton. And before you answer the question, I think it's important to know that 
your pickup line would work with Shayna. So <laughs> I think that really sets the stage. So is cheddaring done with lots of different kinds of cheese uh, and not just specifically cheddar or is it cheddar related? Um, it's, it's, it's pretty unique just to cheddar. Um, it, I mean, cheddar gets its name because that process. The cheddar is named after the process, not the other way around. That process itself is named after a gorge in England and all that stuff. And, and that cheddaring process, the idea of taking these curd slabs and stacking them together over time, it, it has a few implications. One is texture. You're almost recreating part of the pasta filata process here by elongating that structure a little bit. A lot of the old school cheddar makers would say a really well-aged, perfectly made cheddar should have the texture of candle wax. When you bite into it, you see the lines of your teeth going through it, and that, that's due to the cheddaring process. But this is also being done in a steam jacket and kettle, which is warm. So you're giving those microbes lots of warm, high humidity conditions to really go to work and produce interesting flavors. And um, some cheeses do something sort of similar to this, but not exactly, uh, like Swiss cheeses, they'll cook to higher temperatures, which is encouraging microbes to grow, but they're not doing the, the process of stacking and doing that. And to be perfectly honest, at the artisanal level, um, you're not going to cheddar if you don't have to, because it's a lot of work. It is literally backbreaking work, because you might imagine the, those slabs may look light, but they're still full of water and whey. Like that little block that person um, just lifted up there probably weighs at least you know, 30 pounds, and you have to do that all day for hours over and over again, constantly flipping it over and over and over. And industrially, of course, they don't do this. They have something called SMCs, salting, matting, conveyors, which is recreating the cheddaring process, or at least a bastardized version of it. And, and then we have another question from Jeff um, yeah. asking, um, the sheep milk cheddar is uh, weeping, uh, sweating. Um, why is that? when the rest of the cheeses don't have that. So um, do you want to answer why the sheep milk cheese might be weeping? Sure. So so that weeping is probably fat. Um, if it's at room temperature, which your cheeses hopefully should be, because you want to taste them a little bit warm, not straight out of the fridge. And I think you're seeing a byproduct, something you saw earlier, that these cheeses usually have a little more fat in them because the milk's a little fattier. And as it, as it gets a little warmer, milk fat is a complex thing. Some of it melts less than room temperature, some melts way above room temperature. Uh, most people think of milk fat, oh, it's just like butter, it's, it's not gonna melt. Ah, it's a little more difficult than that. Sometimes at room temperature, some things are gonna come out of solution and melt and you'll get a little surface moisture, surface fat. And that might be one thing you're seeing. And I th it really has to do with the composition of the cheese. So if it's a little higher in fat or moisture, you, you might see a little more weepingness or sweating. Yeah, what we what we tend to say when you see that is you want to lick that up. You don't want to wipe it off. That's right. Yeah, no, you don't you, want to lose that. That's a lot of the flavor right there. So go for it and don't be bashful. That's right. Feel free. You know, it's a great exfoliant. Rub it on yourself. It's good for the skin, I'm sure. Cheesemakers have the softest hands because you might imagine there's like, they're elbow deep in dairy fat all day. And for being such manual labor, they have the softest skin because of that. So you can you can do the cheesemaker dermatology approach. Awesome. Um, and here we go. I should have just clicked one forward because I was talking about cheddar. Um, so the cheddaring and the milling. So you take those slabs and you put them through what's called a curd mill. And that sort of breaks them up into little pieces. It breaks them up into cheese curds. And that's what cheese curds are. You take this big orange block that's seamed together and break it apart again. That's what cheese curds are. And sure enough, here are those cheese curds here. This is some cheddar being made into a 20 pound block at the University of Wisconsin. Here you can see some really soft cheeses being made. So as you might imagine, this cheese over here, these solid little chunks is gonna be much harder than this cheese over here, which this is the same step in the process. They're putting into hoops, we call them, or forms, the block, the shapes. These are hoops over here. And as you might imagine, how much moisture is at the stage is sort of, you're setting the stage how much moisture is gonna be there when you go to eat it. Um, so, so some will drain from both of the still, but soft cheese, hard cheese, basically what we're trying to get across here. Um, and then and then you press the cheese. I didn't show that because you might imagine it, it varies depending on the type of cheese. Some cheeses aren't pressed at all. They're just under their own weight like the brie. And salt, salt's a hard step to talk about because salt can be applied to various parts of the process like cheddar 
it was already salted before it got put in that form. Those curds already had soaked up some salt because they sprinkled salt on top of them. Uh, but things like mozzarella, Swiss, Gouda, 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 however you like to pronounce it, um, those are brined oftentimes. They take, the, they take the finished block of cheese and throw it in some brine. And uh, depending on how big the cheese is or how dry it is, dictates how long it spends in brine. Parmigiano Reggiano is put in brine. As you might imagine, it takes quite a long time for it to soak up salt because those are big wheels. Those are 80, 70 pound, 100 pound wheels. So it could spend a month in brine and then take several more months after out of brine for the salt to actually work its way all the way to the center of the cheese. Um, and actually, I've, I've done this before to show you how much time I have on my weekends on my hands. Taking some parm from the outside and from the center of an already aged Parmesan Reggiano. So it's, I think it was 18 months old. So it was, it was really well aged. And the salt content actually differed by over 2%. Outside was like 7%. Inside was like less than 4 um, That was cheese that was ready to eat. So as you might imagine, cheeses are really big, take a long time to get salt all the way through it if you're brining it. Not something you have to worry about if you salt all the pieces before they're pushed together, like with cheddar. And if you have really small pieces of cheese, you don't even need to brine. You can just put salt directly on the surface. Lots of wash rind cheeses are done this way. So the sneaky ones, they just sort of grind salt on the surface. Not only does that encourage... Um, certain microbes that grow here, like the ones causing the orange color. Um, it also, salt, some salt's absorbed as well. And since they're really soft, it doesn't take much time for it to absorb enough salt to get salty. Um, and here's an example of some Limburger being salted this way. Um, see, those are pretty small blocks. I didn't put anything for scale here, but here I will, I'll do my best to draw what a human hand would look like on one of these. There we go. Oh, I forgot a finger. It's the hand from the Simpsons. There we go. Um, so, as you might imagine, they can get salt from the surface pretty easily. Um, salt serves lots of functions in cheese, as you might imagine. Flavor, of course, is the main one. Not only does salt taste good to people, and, but salt also helps bring out other flavors. Salt makes things taste more like what they taste, we like to say, because um, it helps balance other flavors. And that, that brings us to our last cheese here, um, the, the Pecorino Romano, which is a pretty salty cheese as you're going to taste. And the Pecorino in there and the Romano, uh, they refer to different things. This is basically like an Italian style sheep's milk cheese. And so you're going to get some sheepy characters, um, but you're going to get a lot of salt as well. Most Pecorinos can push 5% plus salt. And that makes a really good ingredient cheese as well, because you may want to you may want to sprinkle on some pasta and that in itself is a form of salt. Um, but me personally, I just like eating this stuff straight up. I, I really love Pecorino Romano. It's, it's one of my favorite cheeses. And all that salt's doing other things as well. You might actually experience it with Pecorino. It sort of tightens that protein structure. So it, cheese can be a little more crumbly. It can also be a little more restricted to melting. I Meaning you won't get that nice like stretch and flow you will with mozzarella. If anyone's tried to melt Pecorino, Parmesan knows it, it melts, but it's not like pour off a plate melting. It's sort of just softened melting. And, and that's really the main functions there. Um, we'd love to hear what people think about, oh, it looks like, oh, it's new favorite, Reagan Sterner. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff with some Cabernet jelly. That's the, John, you guys are killing it with these pairings. It's, I haven't had dinner yet. I'm, I'm ravenous after hearing all these pairings. You, you need to come down here and spend some <laughs> time with us. We eat a lot of cheese. That's really all we do well, Pat, is eat good cheese. Yeah. And uh, real quick, I was wrapping up here now. Um, from there, we're to our last step. We've, we've applied the salt. Now we can age the cheese however long. Some cheeses aren't aged at all, like cheese curds, for example. Cheese curds are best eaten the day of. Uh, some cheeses, like Parmigiano Reggiano, by law, have to be at least a year old. Some cheeses, like the cheap smoked cheddar you talked about earlier, the producer of that cheese, uh, Tony Hook, he specializes in prolonged aged cheese at cheeses. So he sells 20-year cheddar that you can get um, uh, at least locally and other places as well. And, and at that point, really, can you taste the difference between a 15 year old cheddar and a 20 year cheddar? Probably not, but you know, it's a point of discussion at a party, another pickup line, perhaps way of showing off to your friends that you paid $160 a pound for a 20 year cheddar. Um, and it's just a sort of fun thought that someone had the forethought and paid for air conditioning for refrigerated space for 20 years, like when this cheese was made, Enron was still killing it and, you know, destroying the energy markets in California. 
<laughs> That's, is that a really good feeling to have? A really. I one time I I did the reason I came up with that is like on the spot someone's asked me like wow this cheese is so old and they were trying to think about something and I I just so happened to know like oh we just passed the twentieth year of Enron being defunct and I've just stuck with it since then not exactly casting the cheese in the great light but cheese cures all and I'm so I didn't even think about it but it's, that's 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 down in your guys' territory as well so yep um well that's but, fun well I've got a question here. Uh, from Jeff, uh, why is the mold growth in blue cheese safe to eat? That's a good question. So I like to expand it out and say microbes in general, some are safe, some aren't safe. And you can think about the same way you'd like to think about it. Um, things called pathogens or microbes that make you sick. And for molds, molds themselves won't necessarily hurt you, but they produce toxins that can. I know when you're redoing your house and you see that black mold, um, it itself, it may can cause asthmatic issues if there's lots of it in the air, but it can produce a toxin that if consumed, that's, that's not good for you. Um, but the molds used in blue cheese are ones that don't produce those toxins. They do something really specific, which is breaking down fat, which gives us the flavor. And there's actually been some really cool microbiologists, uh, Rachel Dutton, Benjamin Wolf, they're at UC San Diego and Tufts respectively now that were at Harvard before they did this massive study. They collected over 900 different molds from all cheeses they could find across the world. And they did not find a single one that was hazardous to human health. They couldn't find one. They kept looking, 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 trying to see if one would grow on cheese. Um, but one of the nice side products of these molds is once they start growing in the cheese, nothing can really compete with them. So like a blue mold and the cheese, for example, it is really hungry it consumed all the nutrients, not given much room for the other molds to grow. Um, so that was just a big roundabout way of saying uh, the microbes used in cheese making are just strains that, that aren't dangerous to humans. Um, that was that, awesome. Thank that you was so, so much. Fun. Yeah, well, we are grateful uh, that you came and spent time with us. Now, it, it is an opportunity um, if anybody wants to ask questions for Pat, um, there, th this is a great opportunity. We are, uh, I'm excited to announce our second Cheese 201. There were over 60 of us here on the on class tonight. And so Pat and I want to do it again because I'm a cheese geek. I learned a ton tonight. I've been studying cheese for 12 years, just scratching the surface. And the more I learn, the, the more I know I need to learn. You will hear that from every cheesemonger that you ever get to meet. Um, so if you do have a question, throw it in the chat window. I'd love to uh, get it answered for you. But also, uh, I'm going to make live here in just a moment or two on August 12th. We're going to do Cheese 201, uh, the science of flavor compounds in cheese, which is like Kendall might actually teach that class because that was her request. Uh, but I'm going to fight for it. So you may get one of us. But I am going to make it live in a few minutes because I just think that's so cool. Um, and then here, uh, uh, we got another question, Pat. If you could only eat one cheese for the rest of your life, what would it be? And a cheese like Velveeta or a cheese product that lasts for the rest of your life is not an inappropriate answer. So. Uh, John, if you're, you're shackling me here, but uh, no, it's- You don't have to answer either. If you don't no, I, I will. I, I'm, it's one of my favorite cheeses. Um, actually, it's, it's actually any cheese by this one maker in Wisconsin, Chris Raleigh. Um, fourth generation cheesemaker. His story is perhaps the coolest, and he produces some interesting uh, hybrid cheeses, cheddar blue hybrids, which I'm a huge fan of. One's called Red Rock, another's Dunbarton Blue. Not only are they some of the most beautiful cheeses ever, I'm a sucker for aesthetics. If you couldn't tell, I'm a graphic designer in my free time. So, but what they what they what they show, they also back up with flavor. And he just Swiss immigrants came here in the 1800s. His grandfather. And father made cheese for Kraft. I'll just call them out now, Kraft. Um, that's, a, that's probably it's a fun little tangent that these companies we associate major cheese brands with, Sargento, Kraft, they don't actually make cheese. They take other people's cheese, buy it, put it in their packaging. So his family made Kraft, industrial cheddar, for years, but they couldn't make money because they couldn't compete with the big guys coming up. And so when he's going to give his business to his son, Chris, um, Chris is like, I'm not sure we can handle this. So Chris against his father's wishes, like we're gonna do something completely different. 
we're going to lean in and do some wacky, really fun, artisanal, handmade, never been done before cheeses, uh, American originals, so cheddar blue hybrids that are absolutely to die for. And uh, that's my favorite. There we go. There, that was you. Probably didn't want a 10 minute soapbox speech, but there it is. That's awesome. That's so awesome. And we got a question that uh, from a customer that asked um, uh, if they can, or if you can order the cheese and stuff. Uh, uh, there's a good chance that you can. A lot of times we just have the cheeses for the events team. Um, so I don't have a great answer for that. Um, and, and you are, uh, uh, John, you're like the hundredth person that asked if we're selling the balsamic onions. Um, uh, I, there are some, uh, my retail, my right hand guy is on the call right now uh, are on, on this uh, session. So maybe he'll finally feel like it's time to add balsamic onions to the online ordering system. Um, so I don't have an answer for you, uh, but hopefully in the near future we have it. Dawn, it's so great that you got to come on. This is like your 15th event. Um, Megan and Kevin, happy 14th anniversary. That was pretty awesome. Um, and, and Pat, this was amazing. Um, I am thrilled that we have the opportunity to work with you. I can't wait for the next one. Uh, again, I'm in, always inspired by your talks on cheese. It's amazing. Um, and for all of you that signed up for this, getting, getting the opportunity to learn from somebody like Pat is a gift for me. And I'm grateful for all of you joining us tonight, giving us this chance to, to dive deeper. I, I, I assure you this is going to be one of the required trainings for new cheesemongers in the future. So if any of you want to become a cheesemonger, you've already done the first requisite at this point. You got, you're moving up. Um, and so uh, uh, unless there's any last questions, one of the little things that I would love to do is to take everybody off mute so that you can use your own voices to thank Pat because- well, There's too Pat, much, John. This, this was amazing. Disagreeing my Midwestern humbleness. I don't like all this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you, Pat. Bravo. Thank you. 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 Well done. Very Thank well done. Thanks, everyone. Hope enjoy the cheese. Buy more from the Antonellis. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was fun. It was so much fun. I just made the uh, August 12th event live too. So Pat, we're on, man. We are so Good. on. Let's keep those expectations low though. It's under commit over. <laughs> <laughs> don't under make, you don't make profit by, by keeping expectations low. <laughs> <laughs> under commit and overperform. That's my motto. <laughs> we, just, we give you enough time to work on props. That's true. Yeah, I, I, I have to get some other ones. Um, well, I do have others, but they just, I can't use the green screen then because I need more space. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. And, well, so yeah, those of you that are still on, this was awesome. Uh, if you want to say anything to Pat as you're signing off, go ahead. But thank you for being here. I'll just... Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. It was top notch. Thank you, guys. Wonderful so cheese. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. So, Matt. Thank you, y'all. Thanks, right. Casey. Thanks, Ann. I'm not Creamery shirt. Love it. <laughs> that was awesome. Well, thank you, Pat. I'm going to sign us off for the evening. You were amazing. And thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate it.